uh, my great pleasure to be here, and thank you, Aidan, for such a wonderful uh, uh, agenda of meeting uh, many of you uh, this morning and hopefully later today. Uh, so what I've decided to do for this talk, I'm going to present for half an hour and leave half an hour for questions. So during my presentation, if something doesn't make sense, please interrupt me, but leave all the big juicy questions for the end. And I'm hoping that you'll be interested enough in this topic that you'll ask me lots of questions uh, and hopefully give me some solutions because I don't have the answers to these. Sounds good? All right. So today's talk is called Climate Change Advocacy and Ad Hominem Attacks, and this is work in collaboration with uh, Dave France and Elfie Weber. So what are ad hominem attacks? Um, ad hominem attacks are basically attacks to the person. Uh, they happen in almost any controversy. It's basically me saying, uh, all right, I disagree with you not because of the topic, but because of who you are as a person. And so climate change deniers are often accused of financial conflicts of interest, as are climate change scientists. So let me give you a concrete example of an ad hominem attack in the climate change domain. In 2006, a press, a press release attacked Al Gore's credibility with his home energy use, reporting that he devoured uh, roughly 20 times the national average in terms of his home energy use. So again, this is not attacking his of what he was talking about in terms of climate change advocacy, but it's basically saying, I don't want to listen to him because of his energy consumption. So that is an ad hominem attack. In uh, 2007, Gore refused to take the personal energy ethics pledge that James Einhoff asked him to take. So again, uh, you know, attacking his credibility. And the question is, how, why, does it, why is this important for people that are working in the climate change domain? So this is a very personal research topic for me. Uh, when I was a postdoc at Columbia, I got invited to go to Minnesota for a talk. Um, so I, and at the time, I was working on people's perceptions of energy consumption. And someone in the audience raised their hand saying, hey, listen, you flew here. I don't want to listen to a single word you have to say. And I was like, really? What does energy perceptions have to do with me flying here? I mean, I'm just telling you how people think. How, you know, what are people's cognitive biases about how they perceive how much energy different appliances use? So these ad hominem attacks happen all the time. We just are not very um, cognizant of them happening. So in general, academics tend to fly a lot. I flew here and on my way to my own Thanksgiving trip, so I tried to couple these trips together, but I did fly here. Um, so in terms of our own carbon footprints as academics, academic researchers are among the highest emitters. I'm sorry, guys and gals. Uh, primarily due to flying to conferences, project meetings, and field work. They argue that the research community needs a roadmap to reduce our own carbon emissions. And so what, did, what would that roadmap look like? Uh, in uh, 2015, uh, Nature magazine had an editorial saying, we really need to focus on some of these small actions that can collectively have a large impact. And I'd love to sort of discuss this with you, especially given today's political climate. How do we make action, how do we basically uh, stabilize our CO2 concentration given where we are today in terms of the political divide. And so uh, what this editorial argued for is we really need to think about how to change institutions, both individuals, institutions, organizations, to get people to change their behavior. In terms of what's happening uh, in, in academia, Eric Holthaus and Peter Thomas, they both sort of did a carbon footprint for their own lives, and what they found was uh, flying basically dominates all uh, their entire carbon footprint. So let me walk you through this. This is the uh, this, is, this is sort of the carbon map for Peter Kalmus. Uh, air travel accounted for roughly two thirds of the author's annual carbon emissions. Here it is for Eric Holthaus, and here's his travel. This pink part is air. That's his car travel. So again, air flying dominates. These are two examples. Uh, there are lots of other examples, but I just wanted to demonstrate with two. And so there, have, there has been a small but growing concerted effort to try to think about how should academics and researchers gain credibility by decreasing their carbon footprint. So Peter Kalmus just came up with this book called Being the Change, Live Well and Spark a Climate Revolution. So he's actually given up flying altogether. I don't really know how to do that as an academic. Does anyone in this room like not fly at all? Okay, so we need to figure this one out. 
uh, there's this uh, uh, group called uh, Climate Scientists Who Don't Fly that he belongs to. There's also a change.org petition calling on universities and professional associations to try to reduce flying altogether. So this is great, but how does my carbon footprint impact my credibility? And so that's what I was really interested in looking at. So I got attacked in this way. I'm sure, has anyone else sort of faced a similar question by an audience member? Raise your hand. No one? Okay. Uh, surprising. Uh, but I wanted to understand how does um, these types of attacks impact credibility? So this paper was published uh, last year in Climatic Change. It's called Statements About Climate Researchers' Carbon Footprints Affect Their Credibility and the Impact of Their Advice. So let me walk you through this paper, and then I also want to show you brand new work that we're working on as, uh, as the months pass on. So a lot of my work uses online surveys uh, run on Amazon's Mechanical Turk. So these are non-representative samples of United States uh, 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 residents. Uh, this particular study has two separate surveys together, roughly 5,000 participants. Lots of separate experimental arms. So I'm going to actually show you 18 separate experimental arms. So these are between condition uh, results. And these are all, again, conducted online. So the way uh, we set up this study, we first had participants read a vignette about a particular cli uh, uh, climate researcher. And one of my own heroes in this field is Jim Hansen, uh, who uh, was the head of NASA's GIS for, for many years and basically has now become an advocate. So I actually designed this uh, climate researcher around Jim Hansen's CV. So you are attending a talk by a leading climate researcher. Uh, she has been publishing scholarly articles in the field of climate science since 1974, has over 150 publications in the top journals, including many in Science in Asia. The researcher explains how an individual's actions can collectively have a large impact on the environment. She gives examples of these actions, such as air travel and the amount of energy used in home. She also explains how these actions have negative effect on the environment. Near the end of her talk, the researcher gives advice to the audience on how they can reduce their own energy use. She gives examples such as flying less, using less energy at home, taking public transportation, and she urges the audience member to make these changes. As you can tell, female. So I wanted to also look at whether there was an impact of gender on uh, credibility. So we actually uh, buried uh, he, she um, uh, pronouns in, in the study as well. So every vignette started off with this paragraph, followed by these different experimental arms. The first one was high fly. So you later find out that the researcher flew across the country to the talk that you attended, and she flies regularly to, the, to give lectures and conferences all over the world. Flying like this leads to increased negative impact, and that had a male-female version. Low fly, that you later find out that the researcher flew to the talk that you attended, but chooses to fly only twice a year. Uh, regularly calls into meetings, conference calls, choosing not to travel. Buys offsets. So do, do you guys know what carbon offsets are? So you can basically buy a carbon offset to offset the amount of carbon that you released by a particular action. So you later find out that the researcher flew to the talk that you attended, and he regularly flies to conferences, but he also buys, he contributes to the negative effects, but he commercially buys his commercial offsets for flying, buying offsets can fund projects to reduce emissions elsewhere. So that led to seven conditions. The two other ones were high home and low home. You later find out that the researcher consumes much more energy than the average person at home, has a high home with high lighting, heating, and cooling bills. Um, and then low home was low lighting, heating, and cooling bills, has switched to slightly more expensive but green energy provider and has invested in energy efficient appliances. So those were our seven conditions. After, after seeing one of these seven conditions, these were randomly assigned, um, participants were asked, what are your immediate thoughts about the research presented and the researcher's own behavior? After we asked uh, participants this open-ended question, we then asked, based on the advice provided, would you be willing to incorporate any of these behaviors in your own life? Flying less, using less energy in the home, taking public transportation, thinking about changing some actions, priority conserve energy, change no actions and others. But for the purposes of this talk and the work that I'm gonna show you, I'm only gonna focus on the top three. Any questions so far? Everyone with me? Yeah? So we also wanted a measure of researcher credibility. So we had to create one because there wasn't one uh, of the news. So we used six separate statements and we looked at how much people agree or disagree with these statements. Statements included, I believe that the researcher's behavior is consistent with his advice. 
I believe the researcher's advocacy is, is sincere. I doubt the researcher's credibility, and so on. So the score, so credibility was scored was scored as a sum of uh, uh, um, strongly disagree or strongly agree on these six statements. And it sort of ranged, we basically rescaled it to go from plus one for maximum credibility to negative one for least amount of credibility. So that's how we measured credibility. Um, the other questions we looked at were climate change beliefs and attitudes, and these are taken from uh, Liz Irich and Ed Maybach's work. How important is the issue of climate change to you personally? Um, do you think climate change is happening? How sure are you that climate change is happening? Political orientation and demographics. So that's sort of the first entire survey. Now let me show you the results. There's a lot to go through, so let me walk you through it. So here you have a uh, credibility score from negative one, least amount of credibility to most amount of credibility, and here are the different experimental arms on the x-axis. Let me walk you through some good news first, because this is a lot to take in. Females and males are the same. <laughs> That's really good. Um, so there's this huge difference between high fly and low fly. As you can tell, uh, the climate researcher that's, in the, in, that's low fly, that's not flying that much, has much higher credibility than the high fly condition. Offsets are somewhere in the middle of high fly and low fly, so believe it or not, offsets do not wipe the slate clean. Even though a lot of people think of it as wiping the slate clean, it really doesn't psychologically. High home is really crappy. So if you have a lot of energy use in your home, that really decreases your credibility. And low home, you're basically hitting the ceiling. Like low home is awesome. So if you're not consuming that much energy in your home, you're doing great. Does that make sense, the general pattern? Okay. So we were really concerned. So why did we have study two? We were really concerned that this open-ended question, me saying, hey, what are your thoughts about the researcher and the research provided really led to sort of um, me climbing participants. So we wanted to get rid of this open-ended question to see whether the effects would still remain. So we removed that, but then we also wanted to understand why did offsets not work? Like there's this huge uh, market for offsets. It's sort of a bio beware market because offsets can run anything from like a dollar per ton CO2 to like a hundred dollars per ton CO2. So why is it that offsets didn't work? So we really wanted to carefully choose these offsets. So for one through five, we sort of got rid of the female version because we found that males and females were the same, so that's good news. So we got rid of the female version, so we replicated uh, the first five conditions from the first survey, and then we added these other conditions. So what we first did was, generally, uh, a researcher's not gonna come up to you and say, all right, I flew here, I regularly fly, this is my home energy use. Researchers don't usually do that. It's usually through an audience question hey, what does your home look like? Or, hey, what exactly are you doing? How are you doing it? Like, what does your energy consumption look like? So we added this audience question lead in. Lead in. <coughs> During the question period, a member of the audience asks the researcher whether he flew across the country to get the stock, and he replies he regularly flies. So we basically have these AQs, which are called audience question lead-ins, and then an offset that's carefully chosen and effective. So we basically say, hey, this is really effective. We've shown that it's effective. Offset that's carefully chosen and effective with an audience question data. And we got rid of this open-ended question. So I'm going to show you the results from these, uh, uh, from, these uh, from, the, from survey two. So over here you have, one is basically survey one. Uh, LL is later you learn. And AQ is audience question data. And as you can tell from these results, and again, on the y-axis here, you have mean credibility from negative one to positive one. Negative is bad, positive is good. So what you notice here is, uh, let me walk you through a couple of uh, different um, findings. So the offsets are really clustered. So really, even carefully choosing this offset, making sure that it's a really valid offset, does not wipe the slate clean. It's still in between uh, high fly and low fly. Uh, low home is awesome. But what's really interesting, as you can see across all of these, is that the audience question lead, uh, lead in basically acts like a buffer it sort of decreases the effect of sort of me um, coming up to you and telling you, hey, this is my carbon footprint, this is what's going on. So it, it, when it comes up more naturally, it acts as a small amount of buffer in the system, a small amount of friction in the system. But in general, number one, we replicated the first study, so our findings hold. Number two, uh, these are significant differences across those, these large five conditions. Number three, offsets do not wipe the slate clean. 
And if you really want to do something to gain credibility, you really should think about a low, low home energy use. Make sense? So that's our finding from, the, from study one and study two. Now here are some more surprise findings. So we, we looked at participants who said climate change is very important and, climate, and participants who said climate change is not very important. Surprisingly, these findings hold for both groups. It does not only occur for one group versus another. So as you can tell, the overall pattern um, that you notice for people that find climate change is very important, is very similar for people who find climate change is not very important. The more extreme for people who find climate change is not important, but a similar effect happens for both groups. So it's not that me believing in climate change sort of uh, uh, sort of um, prevents me from getting ex from from sort of succumbing to an ad hominem style attack. So that that was a very surprising result for us. Um, I'm going to sort of uh, distill some of our uh, analysis for you. What we found was conservatives in general tend to trust less. Trust increases with climate change importance. Trust increases with climate change belief. And in general, males tend to trust more. And this is across both study one and study two. And this is looking at researcher credibility. How does this affect whether people are willing to do some of these behaviors? So remember we asked about whether you would be willing to fly less, use less energy in your home, and use public transit. Over here, we have uh, on the x-axis, researcher credibility from negative one to one. And this is proportion intending to conserve energy. What you notice is there's this really strong upward trend. So if you have, um, if you if you believe that the researcher has high credibility, you're much more likely to say that you're going to increase, uh, sort of, you're going to start saving uh, energy in the home. You're going to fly less, and you're going to use public trans transport more. And this effect is the strongest for home energy use. So much so is that the the, the difference is really staggering. So it goes from when. Your researcher credibility is negative one. It goes from 29% uh, of participants saying that they're going to engage in saving energy at home to 90%. It's a huge, staggering difference. So even though, as I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, flying really dominates when it comes to researchers' carbon footprint, we're not held accountable to flying. As I showed you, like flying is not what people care about most. It's really about my home energy use. So I think that that's actually a misperception because people, participants, our novices, don't really think about flying being the primary contributor to their carbon footprint. They actually think about um, home energy use rather than flying. So in terms of summary for the first paper, this is already published, ad hominem attacks based on personal energy use of climate researchers can be highly effective. Um, reports of large carbon footprint reduce researchers' credibility, except especially for home energy use. Differences in credibility strongly affect participants' inclination to change their own energy use uh, behaviors. Good news, gender of the climate researcher doesn't matter. Bad news, purchasing uh, carbon offsets does not wipe the slate clean. And these effects on credibility and on intentions to save energy occur for varied audiences, both for liberals and conservatives, both for people that uh, <laughs> believe climate change is happening and important, as well as those who don't. So this led us, I mean, this was like the first paper in this uh, area, uh, looking at ad hominem attacks on climate researchers. So this led us to like, you know, it's like whack-a-mole, but except we don't whack the mole because we like moles. It's like um, lots of other, <laughs> my sense of humor is really bad. Um, so they're just like, you know, there are lots of these tendrils that come out. So here are some of the tendrils that we've been thinking about. How enduring in general are these effects? How do reported intentions relate to actual behaviors? Because we're just looking at reported intentions here. Like, are you willing to do these behaviors? How does the damage from attacks compare with benefits for preemptive defenses? So I actually told you at the beginning of this talk, hey, I flew to Ohio, but I coordinated with Aiden to make sure that I flew here on my way to my Thanksgiving trip. So I coupled my trips. Was that a preemptive defense? And are you guys allowing me to like do that? Like, do you, Or is my credibility really bad right now. You can tell me later. Um, and then the two that we basically chose out of these uh, tendrils going to, what about a researcher that recommends policy? So a lot of climate researchers don't go around saying, hey, decrease your carbon footprint. They actually might be going around saying, hey, you know, think about this policy or this policy. I mean, we're in a, a public affairs school, so we were really thinking about how do we, how do we change things that are um, long-lasting but are very effective. 
So how does this relate to policy support? And finally, can the slate be wiped clean by redemption? Um, so those are the two studies that I'm going to show you today. And these, this is sort of work that's uh, uh, in the works. So when our paper came out in Climatic Change, uh, believe it or not, we got uh, lots of responses from climate change scientists and reporters, both positive and negative, which is fine. Um, one of the responses we got was from Michael Mann, who's a climate change scientist. Um, and he said, personal responsibility plays a role, but the real solutions are going to require policy change at the highest level, including a price on carbon. And I completely agree with this. Like, we need a price on carbon. I don't think anyone in this room would sort of uh, doubt that. And if you do doubt that, let's talk about it in the Q&A. Um, so that, that was sort of one of our reasons for studying uh, uh, policy support, because a lot of us want policy support, but we're trying to figure out how to make it happen today. So the two pieces that I'm going to show you today is the impact of carbon footprint on policy acceptance, and the second is reforming behavior. Like, how do we wipe the credibility of slave claim? <laughs> So policy support, in this study we uh, had 12 separate um, uh, randomly assigned vignettes, very similar to the first ones that I showed you, but we actually wanted to understand policies. So how do we pick and choose which kind of policies to look at? Like there's actually, a, a, we have a climate policy for every day of the year, everything from a, a price of carbon, cap and trade, to um, uh, you know, geoengineering, I mean, you, you name it. There's a, a variety of different climate policies out there. So we actually did a, a very quick and dirty expert elicitation at uh, SPIA, which is an Indiana university. And what we found was, um, here are some of the policies we wanted to look at. Regulating carbon dioxide as a pollutant, including um, um, uh, carbon capture and storage. So that's our first policy. A tax on carbon emissions, which I call a tax. Increasing nuclear energy. Stabilizing human population. Increasing renewable energy and increasing public transit. So those are the six policies we looked at. And then we followed it either by a high or a low home energy use. Because from our first studies, we found that high and ho low home energy use was the ones that people were most uh, sensitive to. So, those, so that's sort of our study setup. And here are the results. Let me walk you through this. Um, on the y-axis here, you have policy support from strongly opposed to strongly support. I've ordered these for you uh, based on what is least supported to what is most supported. So no surprise here, people really don't like population stabilization. Don't know why. <laughs> people like, you know, either people like to have babies or they like freedom to have babies. Uh, followed by nuclear energy, carbon tax, uh, carbon regulation, uh, public transportation, and renewable. So these are ordered based on uh, which ones have the most support to the least support. L here means low carbon footprint, H means high carbon footprint. And what you notice here is that there's significant difference between the low carbon footprint and high carbon footprint versions for each of these policies except for Renew. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. So it's almost like a stepwise. So when you have a low carbon footprint, it's actually a significantly higher, uh, higher policy support than if you have a high carbon footprint. So what we're showing here, surprisingly, is that carbon footprint and credibility actually do have an effect on policy support. Okay. Now, the surprising thing for me personally, and it's not so surprising for my co-author, but for me personally, is why does this effect go away for Renew? And a hypothesis that we have is that there's so much overwhelming positive general support for renewable energy that maybe your carbon footprint doesn't matter at that point. But for things that are a little bit more contentious, like transportation regulations, carbon tax, it really does matter. You guys with me so far? Any questions? Um, here is the distribution of research of credibility from negative one to one for high home energy use, which is a nice, beautiful distribution, and low home energy use. And what you notice is for low home energy use, you're really taking all of these participants and shoving them into the high credibility uh, domain, high credibility bucket. The dark bars here are people that are really consistent across the six questions for credibility. So people that are saying, hey, I either strongly disagree or strongly agree, or disagree or agree to all of those questions that we ask. So people that are consistent across our scale. Um, so really different distributions for researcher credibility. Really cool. Uh, here's a linear regression for researcher credibility, and I'm gonna break this down for you in a minute, but gender really matters, climate change importance, climate change is happening. We added another question is, do you believe researchers should influence policy? This is a brand new question that we added, and that was significant, not surprisingly. Political party orientations, very, 
you know, especially given we were talking about uh, talking about this in breakfast earlier, the New York Times article about highly educated conservatives also sort of not believing that climate change is happening and that it's anthropogenic. So that's uh, not as surprising. Um, and there are also some vignette features that were significant. So sort of to break this down into much more concrete terms, the only relevant demographic variable is gender. So males have slightly higher research credibility scores than females. These are part female and male participants. Political orientation is really challenging. This is no surprise to anyone in this room. Uh, it correlates moderately with research credibility in isolation. But if I were to put climate change beliefs into the same regression, that finding goes away. And that's primarily because of what we're noticing already is that political party, political views sort of, um, and climate change beliefs are sort of, they stand in, in place of one another. They've become, I mean, climate change has become an exceptionally partisan um, issue. And apart from the huge effect of high home energy use, research credibility also decreases slightly for vignettes advocating for nuclear and uh, human population. So if you're advocating for something that I really, really don't like, you're going to already have a lower credibility. So how do we wipe the slate clean? Uh, as you can tell, I went to Catholic school, so I really wanted to understand re Reformation. <laughs> that was my bad joke, you guys laughed. Uh, so we had three levels of uh, Reformation. No reform, some reform, and complete reform. And there are two areas that we looked at, flying and home energy use. So how do we structure this study? In no reform, you later find out that the researcher flew across the country and that he regularly flies to give talks around the world. Some reform, you later find out that a researcher used to fly to give talks all over the world. However, he now flies only twice a year and participates in the rest by video conferencing. And complete reform, however, he has now given up flying altogether. Okay, and there are some researchers that are doing that, but uh, few and far between. So that's sort of our levels of reformation. And here are the results. These are really, like, really good news. This is my good news for the day. Um, this is the original study. This is high, um, high fly, low fly, and here you have uh, credibility scores from negative one to one. Uh, again, high home energy use, low home energy use. Um, so high home, as, a, as you know from before, really low credibility, low home, sort of the highest credibility. But what you notice is for no reform, it's very similar to high, high fly. No reform, very similar to high home. But some reform and complete reform start wiping the slate clean for both conditions, across conditions which is great news. So it's not, you're not actually held to what you used to do. You're held to what you're doing now. So I think that's really good news. If I wanted to gain back a lot of the credibility that I might have lost from having a high carbon footprint, I can say, hey, you know, I've given up flying. Here's my home energy footprint. I actually do have a pretty low home energy footprint. And so this is sort of the good news from, from, from this work. There are ways to, uh, there are paths to redemption, but they're hard. So in summary, ad hominem attacks based on personal energy use of the climate research, especially home energy use, can be highly effective. High home energy use decreases policy support. The credibility slate can be wiped clean by climate researchers decreasing their carbon footprint. So that's all sort of a uh, summary from, from the work that I've shown you. But I sort of also wanted to have discussion questions. As I promised, only half an hour of me talking and the rest of the half an hour is you guys talking. So what would potential preemptive ad hominem defenses look like? How could I sort of go up to an audience, a public audience, an academic audience, and sort of say preemptively sort of um, uh, defend myself against these attacks? Um, what are other potential factors that can alter credibility? What do I mean by that? Is I've only really looked at one, one factor here. I've looked at credibility, I've looked at carbon footprint. But there could be other factors that relate to credibility. So for example, if I'm conservative and if I'm talking to a conservative audience, or if I'm uh, an evangelical Christian and I'm talking to an evangelical Christian audience, does that overpower the credibility that I would lose from having a high carbon footprint or not? So I haven't really thought through both of these questions, so I'm hoping that we can talk through them together in the time that we have left. And then just acknowledge uh, both Indiana University, please come visit us. We're like your sister institution, SPIA. It's a wonderful school. Um, and I'm at the, I'm at the center, the uh, Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Sciences. It's an amazing place. Uh, I hope you all get to sort of do a fellowship there. It's phenomenal. Lots of people that have helped support uh, this work. 
I'd like to thank you for your attention and leave these discussion questions up. And I look forward to, uh, to talking with you. Thanks so much. So yeah, go for it. Take it away. Yeah. So uh, I think an obvious place to start with the credibility thing, right? All future direction for research. It's like, yeah, you have interest, been vested interest in like getting government yes, yes, support. Yes, yes. So, yeah. so for example, I uh, just got my first PI grant from NSF, yes, <laughs> um, on understanding and correcting misperceptions of energy use. So is that a vested interest in climate change or is it a vested interest in science? Right, so I think um, I, I use TIA CREF, but I have no idea where that money goes. It's like magic, right? So we, uh, uh, that's like for retirement. Sorry, right, right. Um, it's like when you, no, when you actually get a real job and then they put like, money in retirement. No, I understand. But yeah, that yeah. Is, it's not yeah. clear how it's related. No, because the thing is, they're, I mean, they're investing in companies, right? I mean, they're right. investing in different portfolios. So, how far. So, I think the, the, the example you gave me was really clear. I don't think that there's a large proportion of researchers that invest directly right, in I see that. I see what you mean, I, yeah, I, mean, so I was just talking about the context of. You mentioned Al Gore at the beginning of the presentation, yeah. and I know it, that he has some interests in that area. Yeah. And, 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 you know, through things like that, where you've got somebody high profile who does have those kinds of interests, it does seem to really reduce credibility. So that might be something that should be. Yeah, and I, and I think you're hitting on like the exact right nerve, right? So, I mean, uh, I was talking about this earlier with, with Robin and others. Like why is why has climate change become such a political divide? Like why 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 climate change, and uh, and how does that relate to other phenomena that are happening that are science based, like you know, the anti vaccination movement, the anti pollution movement? Um, there is a, I don't think those are really related. I mean, you don't think so? The, the, the anti vax stuff kind of it really originates more from the left. It does. A suspicion in but there's a suspicion in science, right? There's a suspicion yeah. in facts. And so I think in some ways they share some commonalities, but they're coming up from different groups. Yeah. And so uh, I'm trying to, I mean, so this year at uh, the center, what I'm trying to figure out is are there ways that you can make, um, are there ways that you can sort of take, uh, transform our energy system? Right? How, are there ways that you can transform our energy system to decarbonize in the short run by providing emotional scaffolding that is right. very attuned to the person and the, to the person that you're communicating with? And I think that that's a that's a I think that's a really important question where we are today because as soon as I say carbon tax, there are some people in the population that just you know that automatically sort of switch switch off, switch down. Yeah, and, and, and which is. It, 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 what it illustrates is public ignorance of economics because fundamentally that's a better way to do it than regulation. And you, you know, it, a, a regulation it imposes constraints on how it can be done, whereas a carbon tax allows the market to find the best way to do it. Sure, but that's assuming like a perfect market, which is, so I would actually push back on that because I think one of the things I also am really interested in looking at, especially where we are today, is political feasibility that is both based on political will and public support. Right. So, you know, we've been, we've been talking about a, a sort of a harmonized carbon tax for a really long time. Bill Mordas has these beautiful models from this dynamic integrated climate system. He can tell you the exact price that it should be today. And I think that's great in a, in a pure world where everything is um, controlled. But I don't think that, I think that not really considering political feasibility is a huge issue. I mean, you could sell it in terms of deficit reduction, not to mention I, that we're going to yeah. producing other taxes. I think that you really need to consider political feasibility. But yeah, but but let's open it up to right, other. Right, yeah, sorry, sorry. no, 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 you're, you're good. I mean, I, I, that's exactly you're, that's exactly the type of conversation I want. Yeah, that, that, can I, to go back to some of your findings. Sure. Um, yeah. The one thing that stood out to me from the, the first study, the second, was the importance of uh, gender. Uh, can you elaborate on why you see like you see a significance in that, and perhaps for some of the reason why you might see a significance in the second one, but you didn't see it in the, in the first one? No. So in both studies, males tend to tr trust more. So uh, oh, okay. uh, so there are two separate genders we're talking about here. One is gender off the communicator, oh, I'm which sorry, is not that. a significant finding. So it doesn't matter if I'm female or male; we're both held to the same standards, and that's what I was really happy about. The second gender that we're talking about is, uh, as an IV in our regressions, males tend to trust more. Okay. I don't know why that is. 
why do women, why are women more skeptical? I don't know. Yeah, are they smarter of the species? Or? <laughs> that was another joke. If only the women laughed. <laughs> Sorry. I warned you guys about the bad jokes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure about that but, that, but that was a constant finding across all of our, so I, I basically, I think I showed you um, between study one and study two, probably 10,000 different participants. So it's, it's, it's held across all of the different studies that I've showed you. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if this is intuitive or not, I'm just thinking like, is there a way that with the flight uh, aspect um, that maybe people are kind of thinking of just daily scheduled flights as inevitabilities where you're, you have a lot more control over your house, but the flights are scheduled like a year in advance. And so maybe if you could tinker with the question to make it look like you chartered a flight or you and a group of researchers chartered like a little, I don't know, something like yeah. that to make it seem like no, I, I think it's you're, a little yeah. less inevitable that the flight was gonna happen. Or just, just something that emphasizes the role of consumer demand in determining what flights right. are scheduled. And, and that's actually sort of a great point because uh, that's what we discussed in the paper as well, which is we think that people care a lot more about home rather than flying because of locus of control. Yeah. So you can control your home, but you might not be able to control whether you're required to fly for work or not. So uh, that's sort of, a, I'm going to let you have a pass for flying, but I'm, I, re, I mean, you really have complete control over where you live and how close where you live is to work and what you put inside your house and how efficient your house is and whether you're buying green electricity. All of those are in your complete control. So I think that that's like what's happening psychologically. So they're sort of um, discounting one, but sort of uh, really holding you accountable to the other. But we haven't looked at so for every one of these, you could sort of tinker one thing and create yeah. like, as, as I said, these tendrils of multiple experimental arms of like showing you maybe across all of these studies, I've probably shown you 18 to 25 separate experimental arms. Um, and so the question is, what is the next most fruitful area to try to figure out what's going on? And, and I think for me is trying to compare carbon footprint to some of these other factors, such as how similar or different you think I am to you as a communicator. Um, and I think that that might be, um, you might be more willing to listen to someone that's similar to you or that's in your social network or that's someone, you know, that's someone that is from your community as opposed to someone who's an outsider who doesn't look like you or talk like you or walk like you, there's a song. <laughs> um, so I, I think that that, some, uh, I think that, that that's sort of an area that we might want to look at, but I'm not sure. Yes, sir. Uh, Thanks for your, your talk. Um, we're the Earth Polar Climate Research Center and I'm a climate scientist. And so one of the things I've been thinking about <clears throat> with the preemptive, you know, the potential preemptive defense defenses, and also this idea that as climate as climate scientists, we can make a, a local or a regional impact. So have you looked at the responses versus, you know, for say a climate scientist that came traveled all the way across country? to give a talk versus travel within the state to give a talk? Because it's combining like local knowledge to, you know, if, if I say that I'm a local expert, right? I'm a local expert on things that are happening here in Ohio. I'm wondering if that would elevate the credibility for the, the people that I'm speaking to in that, in that engagement. So just, just a thought. No, I think that that's a, that's a great idea. Um, I think, like intuitively, I would say that it probably does increase your credibility, especially sort of not traveling very far. Uh, I have actually have a colleague in Indiana that does that, that he only sort of accepts talks uh, in sort of an X radius from Indiana, and he sort of decides what that radius is. Um, but let me ask you, like I find it really challenging. Like I've sort of limited, here's my personal confession, and it's on tape. I'm going to try to, like, uh, I'll bribe Aiden later, try to get rid of that date, but um, still pre-tenure. I fly, I try to limit my flying. I only go to one conference a year, which is judgment and decision making. That's hard because that's not my community, but it's part of my community. Uh, I think this is important research, but I don't think we're there. We're, we're, we, I don't think, I think we still need these huge leaps in teleconferencing. Like all of us, all of the academics in the room have teleconferenced. It kind of sucks. It's not great. There are some technologies out there that are, like, you know, now I'm in Silicon Valley, so there's a store in Palo Alto where, which has robots 
that you can control the screen and you have a joystick where you are, and then it moves around. I kid you not, this technology exists. I don't think it's very good as yet. Because when you walk by the store, random people start talking to you and they're actually like remote. So there's actually no one in the store. Um, so I think we, we still have a ways to go with technology. The question is, how, and someone has asked me this, what are the positive impacts of actually going to these meetings, going to these conferences, going to travel? For me, it's actually not the talks themselves, but it's the like one-on-one -on -one interactions, trying to like get better ideas, trying to form collaborations. And I don't know how to replace that with the technology that we have today. So I still think we need more better technology. I think there are other things that we can work on. So we can work on decarbonizing our energy grid in the short run. And there are ways to do that, but we need to make them politically feasible given where we are today. And I keep repeating myself because where we are today is like not a very easy place to have um, climate policy. So whether it happens through individuals, and I don't want to give up on individuals. So a lot of people in policy, including people at SPIA, including people probably in this room, say, why in God's name are you focusing on individuals? You should be focusing on top-down regulation. You should be focusing on a carbon price. We've been focusing on a carbon price for a really long time. We've not really made much headway in it. We know what the price should be in some senses, but we haven't made much headway. So my question is, which is an open question, is how far can individuals really push the system? And I think it is possible. Like, I mean, and you've been seeing that, like even through like most recently, like, you know, President Trump going back uh, uh, on the ban on uh, elephant uh, trophies that he might still go forward on, depending on what happens. So I think individuals should not be discounted. That's just one sort of very coarse example. Same thing with uh, replacing the re repeal. And there are other people in this room that are experts on that. Um, so I want to focus on individuals. I think we need top-down regulations. I want you to tell me how to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Any ideas? Yeah. Go. You have to. Listen. I mean, I use the word "convince." You have to demonstrate that there's a personal impact of climate in their lives, and that without change, you either adapt or you suffer. And that that has been impactful in a lot of communities, a lot of different communities here in Ohio. Is that you have to make it personal. If it's not personal, you know, we do a lot of research on ice and ice melts, and it's provocative. It's great. But I work with farmers. They don't they don't go to sleep worrying about the glacier melting. What do they they need to know about how extreme precipitation is impacting their livelihood? And the more you can make it personal, I think uh, my hope is eventually the things coming down from the top down will be embraced more than ever. So can I ask you a follow-up on that? So it has to be personal, but it also has to feel like you're not a drop in the bucket. But you don't like you feel like what you're doing matters. So I'm trying to combat a couple of things. There's the uncertainty about impacts, which is a lot. You, you know this better than I do. There's a lot of uncertainty. And you can't sort of point at any given thing. You can point at trends, but you can't sort of point at any given thing saying, yeah, this is climate change. So, you know. so I think that that's a problem. I think so there's uncertainty in impacts. And there's uncertainty in what I can do that actually makes a difference. So there's some things that people can do. But in general, psychologically, a lot of people feel like they're a drop in the bucket. So they say, hey, listen, I, I think this is a great idea, but I don't think it makes a difference. Uh, and some of my other work has, we've sort of asked people, what is the single most effective thing you can do to decrease uh, your uh, electricity use, your energy use? You know what the number one modal response is? Anyone want to take a guess? This is interaction time. <laughs> I teach this with my students later. Come on. What, do you think is a, what, what would you say if I asked you, what is the single most effective thing you can do to decrease your energy use? Don't eat meat. What else? Turn off your lights. That's the moral response, right there. And that, that, that has been held, that response, that misperception has been held since the 1980s. So Willett Kempton has this paper looking at folk perceptions, 1980s up until like 2010, 2014, we still have that misperception. So I feel like there is this, there's this huge potential, but I don't know how to activate it to target sort of the single action bias, this uncertainty, and the drop in the bucket phenomenon. So I, I want to work on that. So if you have ideas, tell me. You know, easy to find online. Atari. The problem, the problem could be partly the way our science 
people get educated about science. You don't learn in high school, and even in high school, you barely learn in, in, in going through an engineering program, except in, you know, incidentally, how to do a simple you know, Fermi estimation, order of magnitude calculation, an intuitive idea of, of what, what, how much one quantity is relative to sure. another. Yeah, I see where you're going. Uh, you, you're saying we need better science education? In, in a more, more a more practical approach to it, yeah. I mean, you, you, you when you what you can learn going through high school is how to you know you plug some stuff into a formula and get an exact solution. And th there need I think there needs to be more emphasis on, on this is order ten to the third. This is order ten right. to the fifth. So there's a couple of challenges there and a couple of solutions. Uh, so with this uh, NSF that I was telling you about. We have, we've actually found ways to provide people heuristics. These are rules, right. uh, uh, decision-making rules, that actually can circumvent education. I know this is like crazy. So let me give you an example. If I tell you large appliances that heat and cool use a lot more energy than you think, that actually improves your perceptions of how much energy different appliances use. I think the order of magnitude estimation is really, really, really valuable. And there's actually people here in psychology that have spent their careers looking at how to increase numeracy. Mm -hmm. Ellen Peters, for example. Um, I think that's great. I think for these purposes, we need to sort of think a little bit more creatively. The multiple pathways of getting there, and I think we need to think a little bit more creatively rather than putting a lot of onus on on education. I think that's great. I want to understand if there are other ways. Because I've spent a lot of time looking at, uh, can you teach people the difference between watts and watt hours? And it's hard. But you can, but it's hard. And I know you're wearing engineering, so it, oh, it, yes. you're, you're speaking, to, you're speaking to my audience, right? But it, it's, it's hard, it's challenging. Yes, ma'am. So I was just wondering, how much do you give credibility to these people who focus so much on your transportation? Because like, we know as people who care about the environment that it's not all about how many times you fly a year. Or maybe even the flying is such a good thing because you can educate people. So, so. Do you ever think that these people have a lot of misplaced anger towards climate scientists about transportation when really they should be worrying about you know other issues that affect the environment? Um, so this phenomena is not just uh, does not only happen in the climate change world. For example, people in general don't like to trust doctors who are overweight to tell them to diet, or doctors who smoke to tell them to stop smoking. So I think that there's this uh, general pervasiveness of ad hominem attacks. What I've shown you here is that it's political and just managing the world, where it's a little bit much, I mean, it's much more diffuse. I completely agree with you that it should really be about policies, and once you have policies in place, you can really transform the system. Is it misplaced anger when people who also believe that climate change is an important topic also sort of adhere to the same um, Types of challenges that I've shown you today, so that graph is shifting with both people who believe climate change is an important topic and it's not. They have it for both groups. I don't know if it's misplaced anger versus um, not necessarily knowing what the solutions are. So I think I think that people don't necessarily know, because I think that as I was mentioning earlier, there are lots of different solutions and they don't know what the solutions are. So uh, recently we had a climate change report come out. Uh, um, <coughs> for our nation. And the scientists for that report actually held an AMA asked me anything on Reddit. And one of the top questions was, what should I do as an individual? What can I do as a person? Like, you know, all the six is not changing, what should I do? And I think that we don't have, as a science community, we don't really have a clear answer to that. I think I can tell you, hey, what's really effective to decrease your energy consumption, but that doesn't really change the system. And I think it's an untapped potential because I think we can change the system through individuals. That's a great question. Yes. Building on Aaron's question, I, I work at the Bird Center as well, and uh, in, in a lot of our interactions with the public, it'd be interesting to see the effect of humanizing the scientist. Yeah. You know, um, you mentioned like what's your faith tradition? You know, discussing your family, discussing where you live, discussing your involvement in your community, yeah. because with most people's only interaction with a scientist being a doctor, yeah. and not really interacting with anybody else. Um, we find that there's a lot of credibility when you go in and listen, yeah. and people know your backstory, and we kind of default to starting our conversations there because there's a, there's a trust built with that give and take relationship that you find out the conversations are much richer. <coughs> Push back. 
But then, I mean, there's a whole deconstruction of that. You know, when you introduce a backstory to an individual, you need something that's kind of neutral right. versus putting the left, left, and right. But we find out that people don't understand the dynamics of science or understanding of what people are doing their work that have a life outside of what they're doing in the research. So I'd love to test this with you if you'd let me. Uh, the, the one example that we have is Catherine Diego, who yes. does exactly what you're talking about. She basically starts off by saying, hey, listen, I come from this tradition. Does everyone know who she is? Some of you, some of those who don't. She's an amazing climate change communicator. She's from uh, Western Texas. Yeah. And she sort of comes from somewhat of an evangelical Christian background, uh, somewhat conservative values. Uh, she was part of this um, climate report. Uh, and she sort of has a lot of credibility with a variety of different audiences because of exactly what you're talking about. So I think that that's valuable, um, and I think that that's, that's a great insight. We need to tap into that a little bit better. How do we scale it up? Yeah, so I think that what you're doing is great, so, so I'd love to sort of learn more from what you guys are doing. And because we have this post-truth world where yeah. you know, emotion, <laughs> gut response matters. Yeah. And, and for many researchers, <laughs> don't help train people on how to communicate or think about the narrative. Every humans are, are primed for narrative. Yeah. And so how do we take advantage of that in telling story and making sure we're actually keeping authentic to the science? Yeah. But people's brains are not set up to see things in terms of graphs and tables. I completely agree. And then the question then is is that what should the what should your audience be doing? And do you really and this is a very tough question for scientists, is that do we really need to convince people about the uncertainties and what's happening with CO2 emissions and CO2 concentration and that it's 400, 405 parts per million right now? Or can we can we just sort of get to, here are the solutions, here's what we really need to be doing, here's how. So that's like an internal battle that's been going on in my head because I'm trained as a scientist and engineer and I'm just like, all right, maybe that's not the pathway that we need. So what are these alternative pathways? Um, so I'd love to talk to you more maybe uh, after. Yes, sir. Um, cool. Oh, right. um, so, I mean, I think it's interesting that people think shutting the lights off is the most um, a direct way of making an impact. And I think about, as a kid going to a museum, that there's an exhibit sponsored by G, and it teaches you, like, oh, plant a tree in front of your window, and that, like, that should solve all the climate change problems. And so, I'm, I guess, like, I always found that funny, or we find that funny because it's, like, G, like, you design light bulb. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, do you see like corporate responsibility, especially as like our cultural shifts to like focusing more on like social responsibility of corporations? Do you see like a corporate responsibility or like value that could be added to this like ad hominem conversation? Uh, absolutely. So there are other people. So I study individual decision making. There are other groups that are emerging right now that study um, decision architecture for our organizations. And where in the organization is the sort of soft spot where you can sort of apply pressure to change the system? So, decision architecture is sort of this uh, growing field. It's this amazing field. I would highly recommend you sort of start getting involved in this sort of creating architecture that helps navigate people through a really complicated um, narrative to help them figure out what to do. I absolutely think organizations and states uh, are going to be involved in sort of forming solutions. One classic example is the fact that both um, Michael Bloomberg and Jerry Brown were at Vaughan negotiating, sort of trying to figure out, all right, what can states do? Um, what can uh, companies do? What can, uh, we've sort of noticed that already with the organics movement, organic food movement, with Walmart sort of, it has negative spillovers, of course, lots of farmers, so on and so forth. But um, we've already started, started to see some of the solutions in other closely related domains. Um, it's still it's sort of we still need to figure out what's going to what's going to happen in the climate change world. But I but I would be cautious about saying hey Elon Musk is going to solve everything because I think that that's part of the solution. But it's it, it needs sort of multiple lines of converging solutions. Yeah. Yeah. So you push your finger on a really interesting and fascinating broader debate of the field of public affairs, which is what is the role of the academic. Yeah. And you made a presumption. In, 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 Literally, in ways of operationalized your frame, at least in the first one, we acknowledge that there may be some variability in terms of how active should I, as the scholar, be as an advocate, yeah. right? And so the first stem presumed that the scholar is an advocate, right? Yeah. And there you've already seated, you've moved away from the traditional role of the academic of providing information. 
machine analysis that we're going to objective to say, I have a position. Now that position may be rooted on the good science and so forth, but you've taken a position. Your job now as an academic is to get in that frame to suggest that there are better solutions. Right. And the second one that sounds and this is what I would get one I stepped away from that. Yeah. You started you, to, you caught that, yeah. Well, so did you change the frame though? So one way, and, and this actually raises much larger questions. We may desire to influence the world. We don't necessarily have to be evangelical about it to change the world, right? I mean we, we face this in our field broadly all the time. Is is it our job to get out in front and be in the fray? Or is it to try and influence those who can be better communicators, better in narrative parts, all of those things? And, and we actually, over time, may undermine our ability to be um, the folks who will actually inform people about what, what the right alternatives are, the long ones, by being advocates of, of one another, because we, we get perceived differently in that role, right? So, now the, the question. Do, have you played with changing just the front and stem to say instead of this is a person here before you trying to tell you these are the right solutions, saying here's a person in front of you weighing the trade-offs or, or, or showing that there are alternative ways to, to address whatever the issue is, and they're just framing those trade-offs for you rather than taking a position. Have you begun to play with, with that at all? Uh, no, so right now, we're still doing data analysis on these last two studies that I showed you, so it's sort of uh, brand spanking you. I think what you're talking about, and I'm just going to sort of try to address your question more broadly because it's a very important one, especially for me and for everyone in this community. So even the students that you have here working, they're working on homelessness and uh, you know our food policies. Absolutely. I mean, you name it. An issue for every day of the year, right? I think it's really challenging to sort of. This is my personal story. I think it's really challenging to sort of care a lot about a problem and work, spend your entire career, even though it's a relatively short career so far, but spend your career working in a problem and not see much happen, even though there's a lot of overwhelming science and evidence. So there, I think that there is a role for evidence-based policy making. I think science, scientists should, should, normative, that's my personal opinion, should influence that. Recently, as of last week, there was a um, National Academy's kind of meeting on the science of science communication. And one of the questions that some of the presenters received is that, you know, science, scientists have like this other job where they're doing science. Now you're adding on this other job of communicating that science. We might not be the best communicators to communicate that science. And that actually might jeopardize our role as scientists because now we're taking a stand. Um, So I'm, I'm not evangelical about what policies we should do, but I am evangelical, we need to do something. So I, I think that's what I've sort of decided for myself, but it's, an, it's, an, but it's not for everyone. So I've had climate scientists say, I don't, I don't belong to that group that you're talking. I mean, so when this first paper came out, uh, as I mentioned very briefly, like, uh, we got some negative criticism because some scientists said, hey, we, we don't go out there, we, don't try to, we, just, we just tell people what the science is. We talk about just the science, just the facts, ma'am just the impacts, this is the uncertainty impacts, and we stop the conversation there. Um, but there are other scientists that actually have started embracing communication and saying, hey, this is what you can do. So most people who actively communicate with public audiences, at least the ones that I know, usually get a question from the audience saying, hey, what can I do? What should I be doing? What, who can I be voting for? What, you know, where is it that I can make the change? Um, Sort of, I'm, I'm rambling to your question well, because I don't okay, really. So, yeah. yeah. Obviously but but to answer your, 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 your smaller question, right. no, we have not changed the upfront vignette. Oh. But the but the last two studies that I showed you, it basically we did have to change the vignette a little bit, saying that the climate change researcher says that these are some of the policies that you can consider. Right. One of the policies, because we didn't show all six policies to any given participant, we only showed one of those policies. <coughs> And so the climate researcher says these, there are a variety of different policies that you can consider. Here is one policy that you could consider. Population stabilization or um, increasing renewable energy. So we had to change the frame because this wasn't about individual behavior change. This was about policy support. But we only showed one policy as opposed to showing a portfolio of policies. Well, interestingly, again, I don't know enough about those two studies. In that second study, I read the data right. Everything was positive. Everything, Everything was, was above zero. 
Uh huh. Mm -hmm. right. You mean you're talking about credibility? Right. Whereas in the first, you had some below and you had some above. Everybody was above neutral in the second set of studies, but in the first one, you had those that were below neutral. Oh, you talked about this one? Yeah. Um, so high over here, the high and no reform for home are below zero. Right. 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 So you, in this first study, you had some that felt yeah. low, yeah. low credit, whereas everybody was more but zero in the second one. Right? Well, uh, little, I mean, so the one through five, Sorry, I've like showed you a lot of different studies here. So let me break it down. So in uh, the first paper, we had study one and study two. Study two replicated everything that we found in study one. And then sort of we, we added more, right? And so uh, those findings hold. Over well, here, we basically, the no reform condition is very similar to, if not, I mean, they're, they're not statistically different from the study one findings for uh, high home energy use and high flying. So those are very similar as well. But in the first study, is first study being study all one the way the oh, all the way to the front? Okay. You had those that were below zero. Uh, you got a lot of responses. No, but that yeah, that. Yeah. There you have some that are. Below yeah. So zero. high home here one, high home right. is very similar to what we have in the last reformation study. Um, but my, my, my yeah. point was, I think it's an, it's an important empirical question for you to investigate. So you, and I, I admire you for, for speaking so personally about what this means to you and the desire to have a position on this. But just as an empirical inquiry, it would be interesting to change the frame and see if you framed the beginning as saying this person was responding to a question or was just presenting information and presented options rather than the way you framed it was, I'm here to tell you what's good for you. No, right? I completely agree. So your doctor yeah. example. Yeah. Yeah. Fathers me to no end when a doctor who doesn't engage in a particular behavior is telling you to engage in a particular behavior. Whereas could if I've gone, whereas if I've gone in and said, Hey, I've got this problem, can you help me with it? I, my frame of reference may be very, very different. So, no, I think that that would be a really great follow-up study for us to run, actually, so thank you. And I think it's particularly important in this field because I do think climate change as a field of study has become activized, right? Yes. Not everyone, but certain members have. Yeah. And, and there's an argument out there that may undermine their ability to influence sure. people over time because they're not because part of, they've lost their objectivity. Yeah. Right? And so again, yeah, just that framing, there are other ways to influence people without advocating publicly. Yeah. No, no, that's great. Uh, that's I'll take that back to sort of our uh, co-authors. I think that's a really great idea. So I think we've reached our magical moment. Yeah. Thank you so much for your attention. Happy Thanksgiving and uh, wonderful questions.